Hello world, this is Better Tech, a podcast where we chat with some of the most successful leaders about the latest industry developments. So join us as we explore the world reliant on tech. Hi Emily, welcome back to Better Tech. So you've been on the show before, so but just so our new listeners are acquainted, let's have a quick introduction about yourself. Great. Thank you. And thank you for having me back on the show. My name is Emily Ominski. Uh, I work for Accenture. I'm based out of our Philadelphia office. I'm asset curator for our Responsible AI team. Um, and I'm also part of the interactive development program currently. Um, and then I'm working with a financial services client at the moment. Um, great, great. So Emily, the topic that we have for today is career challenges and response strategies for the tech industry. So firstly, let's talk about how you got into what you do. Sure thing. Uh, So I actually uh, started out in undergrad. I was studying information science. Um, When I was very young, I thought I wanted to be a computer scientist, but um, it wasn't quite the right path for me. So I switched over to information science, which is very human centric, um, really thinking about the design aspects and how these technologies are um, affecting uh, the human beings who are interacting with them. And I took a class called Ethics of New Media and Technology with Don Schrader um, and loved it and really wanted to get involved in this ethics space. And then uh, was recruited through this This was in your undergrad. Yes, this was in my undergrad, my senior year. I took a a seminar and we would just talk about, you know, these different emerging technologies, like for example, Amazon Alexa, um, if it records uh, something that could be used in a lawsuit, uh, can you use that recording in the lawsuit? Um, Things like that as we you know enter these new worlds of surveillance what is okay and what is not okay um and yeah. these critical issues i was just so so deeply interested in and passionate in um i didn't think that i was going to end up in consulting by any means at the beginning i figured i'd be in silicon valley working for some tech company um but accenture recruited me uh very early on from uh this conference i went to called out for undergrad tech which i would recommend to um any queer youths that are interested in technology um it's a a really great conference that um brings together people from all over the country um a lot of different schools with with different um experts in the field to identify as lgbt and then they do a, a recruiting event afterwards um and accenture was actually my first offer and they had told me they would place me within their digital arm of the company um, at the time, which has now changed to interactive. Um, and I, I just felt like I couldn't go wrong. I, it seemed like the right fit at the time. And, and now here I am uh, over a year and a half later. I was, I was just going to ask you that was this something that you always knew you wanted to do, but you just mentioned that you wanted to be a computer scientist. Yes, yes, exactly. I, I didn't think that I would end up in consulting. I didn't really know what consulting was until I had accepted my job offer. And then it was... Um, a kind of race to, to figure out how this world works. Um, and it's it's definitely a distinct world of its own. In consulting, we switch projects every kind of two to six months. So, so you're always up to something new. I said earlier, I was at a financial services client now, um, but six months from now, who knows, maybe I'll be somewhere vastly different. So is that something that's been the like, most exciting part about your job? The, the fact that you always get to work on something new. Yeah, I do think it is a pretty exciting part of it. And then I've been fortunate that I found our responsible AI team kind of very early on. I emailed our then uh, global lead, Ramon Chowdhury, and she said there was space for me on the team. And I, I just kind of really lucked out in, in being able to do this work with the team. Um, right. And from there have really grown um, my own knowledge and been able to collaborate very globally. Um, Accenture, one Accenture, uh, so we can work with anybody in the world um, as long as we can kind of get in contact with them, which is a a really incredible part. Um, And and one thing that I I really, really do love about working for Accenture is that you can talk to anybody anywhere in the world um, so long as you can wake up for it. So just to follow up to that, what do you think is more important, having uh, like, you know, colleges preparing students for the difficult challenges that they may face in the workplace or to have like a mentor at work? Oh, that is a great question. I have benefited immensely from different mentors um, within this firm, and they are the people who make me want to stay here most. I can kind of think off the top of my head a few different people um, who I will go to if I'm feeling stressed, 
um, or if I need advice on a project, if I'm not quite sure what the right next step is. And, and having those people in the network has been incredible to my growth. Um, I do think it's very important for colleges to prepare students, but um, I think for me, it felt more important that the college was kind of preparing me for life as a whole. Um, I loved my college experience. I went to Cornell University, shout out uh, to Cornell, and um, it, right. it was a remarkable place for me. It was, um, I made so many friends. I took these classes that I'd been interested in in a way that I wasn't interested in high school. And um, I, think, I think that's kind of like college is meant to be that space where you kind of find yourself and begin to feel um, like you are a whole person and maybe not quite an adult yet, um, but you know, entering into that space. And then these early years of work, um, I think it, it's definitely so important to have these mentors in place to see that you can kind of reach these next points in career growth. Um, and without yeah. them, I, I don't know if I would have quite the, the same experience that I've had today. So you've kind of, you know, uh, shifted uh, places in the sense that you wanted to like do something else professionally and you're in a different field of work. And that is often something that people find very daunting, like especially when graduating, for instance, if they want to work and their major wasn't the same, how do you uh, then like kind of like navigate that? How do you ensure a smooth transition to a professional life? Mm. I don't think I have the answer to that one. I don't know if I had the smoothest transition. I have moments and I, I have a friend actually who made a, an impossible or an imposter syndrome rap that was about a minute long and I loved it um, because I think okay. so many people, especially in the tech industry, feel this and especially kind of um, women, maybe minority individuals feel this imposter syndrome effect where it just feels like, you know, what am I doing here? How did I end up here? Do I deserve to be here? Maybe I don't deserve to be here. Um, and it's, it's difficult to overcome that kind of self pressure that seems to weigh many people down. I've noticed it with myself that I'm so much harder on myself than I probably need to be. Um, <laughs> and not always, you know, the, the healthiest self pressure. And so, so it's, it's a journey to overcome that and, and one that I'm still kind of overcoming right now. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. So Emily, what are some of the other tech challenges, challenges people face in the tech industry? Oh, there are so many. Um, I think the one that I think about most obviously through responsible eye is just the fact that um, the solutions we are creating are having impacts on the world unlike those of, of other creations before it. Even if you think of when the automobile was created and that kind of, now everybody could travel, now we could get around to places that we've never been before. It's not quite the same because it was kind of like a one person in one car, or one family in one car. Uh, whereas these uh, technical solutions that we produce today go live and they go global in minutes. You can suddenly interact with you know anybody anywhere. And that scale, I think alters the, impact that that people can have now it is a small team you know of of engineers that are suddenly deciding what everybody sees in their email inboxes or what everybody sees um, on one of these social media sites and so recognizing that kind of immense power that has grown with these uh with cloud and with these global solutions um is, is extremely important and i think um another factor that, that the tech industry has faced is um, the lack of diversity. And I, I, there's a lot of research out there that kind of talks about this, that um, tech companies, I've seen really dismal numbers from different tech companies, you know, that they are maybe 84% male um, and very white majority. Um, and this is something that we, I think, can, can often write off as a pipeline issue, but I don't think of it as a pipeline issue. I think there are a lot of really skilled individuals um, who are not given the same opportunities as others. And so not just at the pipeline, like I do think we need to work to implement uh, STEM courses earlier on um, in education, particularly with for women, um, enabling them maybe in high school even to take those types of classes um, because we enter the college world kind of in competition with kids who have been doing it and maybe haven't done it yet ourselves. Um, but after college, um, looking at kind of further down the road, I think we should look to to increase diversity across the board and Accenture has been great at that we've we've been very public with our statistics um, wanting to reach gender equality by 2025 at all levels of our company um, and wanting to reach better levels of racial equality um, so so I think it is important for tech companies to kind of publicize these goals and to be accountable to them um, and and something that we can improve further as we move forward 
And are any of these career challenges that you've just mentioned specific to women? Yeah, I do think there are specific to women. Um, and I think the pandemic has kind of showed this too. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't have children yet, so I haven't faced those additional concerns, but um, there have been so many numbers that, that just show that women have, you know, picked up the slack with kids at home um, and are doing the majority of the chores um, and, and limiting yeah. them in, in their ability to, to get work done. Um, and I think that there are still stereotypes that persist and maybe not the best types of parental leaves. Um, and it kind of is company dependent and it's specific to the, the culture of your, your company, how, how they are working on it. Um, but those are, you know, just a few. And then the other fact is that um, oftentimes you'll end up in a room that is very male heavy and um, it can be difficult to get your voice heard when, when you are the only woman in the room. Um, especially if the other people in the room may be, you know, of a higher level and you feel um, this kind of hierarchical aspect at play. Um, and so, so I think those are, are kind of two of the, the big challenges yeah. that women can face. And if you were to break them down further, what are some individual level barriers and some organizational level barriers? Yeah, I, so on the individual, of course, the, the kind of family aspects, what's going on in your home life. and on an organizational level, I think it is putting in place the right types of leaves for individuals if they need to take time off or if they um, have just had a child, um, enabling them to return to work with the same kind of ease that they, they left with, um, to kind of jump back in, to have a place to return to, to have a, a team to return to. Um, and then within the teams themselves, it's about really fostering open communication between members of the team and working to make sure that you kind of break the ice early on so that you can grow together and complete great work together. So I'm guessing you didn't face these organizational level challenges so far. I've been lucky. I've really, really been lucky to be part of teams that were intentionally designed um, outside of that kind of rapid response work, which was just every all hands on board, everybody respond. Um, the Responsible AI team in particular, I think, has done a, a very amazing job. It was a, a very intentionally designed community of practitioners within Accenture. And okay. I think all of us within the group are very dedicated to advancing um, various human rights issues, uh, various kind of environmental issues, and, and ensuring that we are kind of sustainably fostering um, healthy minds and healthy habits. Right. So how should an organization structure its response strategy to these challenges? I think it's really about talking to the people on the ground as much as you can, and not necessarily just through surveys. And I have filled out many different surveys asking kind of how I'm feeling, um, but it's, it's creating the openness to have conversations with people across level to understand what their pain points are what their needs are and how they've been affected, especially during this, you know, strange, strange past year where we've all been virtual and we don't quite have the same time to, to make those kind of personal connections. Um, it's, it's about kind of opening up and opening the door to others um, wherever you can in order to make sure that they this, are. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you think this strategy is, comes from the top? Yeah, I do think it's a tone from the top. I love that phrasing, tone from the top. I think the, the leaders need to have it. If leaders are inaccessible, um, then lower levels won't feel comfortable reaching reaching out or, or um, reaching up with concerns. And I think it does come from that kind of top leadership level um, in terms of setting the culture. It is up to, and, and across level, we must set the culture, but I think it's really up to kind of the people at the top to take that accountability for it and that responsibility to ensure that everybody feels that they are cared for within the, co the company and um, feels that they can express concerns when they have them. Right. So can you share an example of one very effective response strategy in your opinion? Hmm. Uh, so we actually, we think about this a lot in terms of governance within the Responsible AI group. How do we set up the right governance committees? Um, who do we kind of place there to make sure that things actually do happen? Um, and I don't know if I have a example of, of one specific time, but it's it's really just about kind of fostering this, this healthy dissent and um, making sure More so that- More culture. Yeah. 
Yeah, it is. I, I think it's it, it ties back deeply into the, the culture is, is do people feel comfortable speaking out, speaking out and speaking up? And um, do people feel safe to be authentic? Do people um, want to be themselves and want to be present? And I, I think that's kind of part of it too, is, is you have to foster this environment where people want to be present with you and don't just want to tune out um, and, and with all of our virtual things in front of us, I think it's become even easier to tune out to um, open an app on your phone instead of paying attention during a meeting or um, to just kind of, you know, zone out from life. And that's not quite what we want, you know, that doesn't lead to the best productivity. Um, and so it's, it's encouraging the, the individual to be present um, right. in the right moments. And how far do you think these challenges are brought about by technological advancements? I mean, you touched upon this earlier, but if you were to like elaborate on it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it introduces so many new challenges. And I think a lot about kind of how our minds are being re rewired by our technologies. Um, I don't I don't think it like anybody today, you could talk to them and, and see that they are a little bit addicted to their phones. It doesn't really matter age or uh, you know ethnicity or demographics, um, the penetration of the cell phone, it's, it's the, the most adopted technology ever of the cell phone. Um, and so we are all kind of being rewired, especially by these social media algorithms that just kind of program us to keep scrolling and to give them all of our time. Um, and I, I think, uh, I love the idea of the attention economy and this notion that um, because information is so abundant, our attention has become the scarce resource and where we place exactly. our attention is, is so critical today. Um, and I, I think that the technologies make it more difficult to kind of place your attention where you want it to. And it's so easy to let the recommendation take you away and just kind of go with the recommendation. And this is a conversation we've been having in Accenture too about, um, does artificial intelligence in some ways take away from the humanity of the individual? Um, and I think artificial intelligence more so than other technologies. I, I wouldn't say the automobile took away from the humanity of the individual. We started using cars instead of horses. Um, but with these algorithms that we kind of let them decide for them and increasingly with algorithmic decision-making that we really let the technology decide for us, it's not, it's not quite clear yet what that takes away from the human being. Um, outside of you know their autonomy and agency but but how does that shift the the mindset and the, the psyche of the human as we adopt these technologies further um is something that we'll, we'll discover in, into the future so you're like what's your stance on it do you think that it takes away from the human touch oh that's hard it depends on the situation, I'd say. And I, I love to think about it in the events uh, or in the case of the recommendation algorithm. I use Spotify probably eight hours a day. Um, most of the music I listen to is from a, a saved set of a thousand songs plus that has mm -hmm. grown over the five years that I've been using it. Um, but then a lot of it is songs that I discover through their um, you know, AI recommendation algorithm. Recommendations, yeah. Uh, similarly, like with Netflix, you know, if I if I ever watch uh, any streaming platform, really, um, I will let, you know, for the most part, I'll pick, you know, from their options. I'm not going out and searching for a specific movie in most cases. I'm kind of scrolling through until I find one that fits me. And I, I like the fact that they personalize it towards me based on my my past watch history. Um, yeah. But it does, it, it's, it's maybe a bit concerning because I've lost this kind of self-discovery. I've given that self-discovery over to the algorithm. Um, the algorithm yeah. is discovering the self for me. Yes, certainly, certainly. I think it's a tricky concept. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's uh, one right answer for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I think it will go both ways, and I think we are at this point in history where we are still shaping the direction that it takes. Mm -hmm. We are still, you know, AI has existed for about fifty years, give or take, maybe a bit more. Seventy, actually, it was in the in the fifties. This quote, this term was coined, um, and we've gone through these different um, seasons of AI, and then we'll have an AI winter where nobody really cares about it, um, and then it comes back. And right now, we are in this really 
hot moment of artificial intelligence where we are asking ourselves these questions, especially when you think of the singularity, when we create this technology that is smarter, better than human beings at everything, what will happen then? I don't think we're near the singularity at, a, at, at this point in, in time, but it's um, always been an interesting kind of philosophical debate. Um, and along the lines of philosophy, I think philosophers have been making these types of critiques and having these contemplations for uh, thousands of years, really, at this point. Um, and now we are kind of forced to make hard decisions that we didn't have to in the past. The trolley problem, for example, is, is a fairly old problem um, where uh, you picture some people tied to train tracks and a trolley is going to hit them. Um, on one side yeah. of the tracks, there are five people and on the other side, there's only one. Um, and if you make a decision to pull a lever, it will just hit one person, otherwise it will hit five. Um, when it comes to self-driving cars, the engineers have to make that decision. If a self-driving car is malfunctioning and it's going to either crash into a tree or um, hit a school bus full of children, the engineer has to start programming around that and making that decision. And, and this is not a new contemplation of, of value of life, but it is now one that we have to explicitly choose. Um, and, and so much of the, the kind of ethics of technology is about making these value judgments explicit and saying, this is what we have decided, this is our reasoning for it. And, you know, it may not be perfect reasoning, but the judgment will be made. And, and once it's made, then it's in this much more final state than it is right now as we're just thinking about it. Yep, yep. So lastly, Emily, what's one piece of career advice you'd give to yourself if you could go back in time and be a senior in college Wow. Um, I think I would give myself the advice to be more careful with the projects you choose. Um, because you kind of, you know, in consulting, it's the space where, where you really jump around and, and you're not quite sure what you've gotten yourself into until you're halfway in the middle of it. Um, yeah. And so, so taking the time early to really pay attention and um, find the right types of projects to do it is difficult it's not an easy thing to do but but something that i would probably encourage myself um, an earlier version of myself to do um and the other part of it is to to try and have fun i think i, I said earlier you know i felt imposter syndrome a lot throughout this um, um time that i've been entering into this workforce world and maybe the pandemic you know like life would have been so different if not for this this strange pandemic that we are all living through but um i think yeah. if i could have encouraged myself to have a bit more fun um even in this time of kind of being alone and um a time of great solitude to to really have fun with it i think would be um and for my future self i i, I hope to give this advice too to just really have fun um whenever i can right right so thanks, Emily, for joining us today. It was great chatting with you. Thank you for having me. I love being back. Um, thank you for having me again. Thanks for listening to WeatherTech. We look forward to bringing you the latest industry news in our next episode. In the meantime, check out our other episodes at techcell.com slash podcast and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss an episode.